Good morning. Thank you, worship team. Can we give them a round of applause? You may take a seat for a few moments. Uh, my name is Caleb Herring. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad to see you two and everyone else because I was here. I wasn't here last week. Um, our family was going through uh, COVID, and everybody's okay. Thanks for your prayers and you know concerns, but we are thankful to be out and about again. Um, one couple more days of school left, so we're excited personally for that to, to work through. I know. All the teachers in the house, yes, uh, we're proud of you for surviving as well. Um, well, I want to just welcome you. We have a few things that are happening today that um, are a little bit new. We're going to be ending our tree sermon series, so I'm excited to wrap that up with you. We're going to have a guest speaker uh, at, uh, to kind of talk through that part with us. Um, I also have Lori Hammer here. I'd love to bring Lori Hammer up. Can we appreciate Lori Hammer, who's with Skit? And I need a mic, so Christian in the back, can we get a mic? Um, if you're new with us, I want to make sure you are, get connected with. There's a little form in the front of you in that purple chair. Fill, out a, fill that out. There's a prayer request, a place where you can put those requests for prayer, and you can drop them in the little basket in the back. If you call this your church home, um, that basket in the back for those prayer requests or connect cards is where you can drop an offering or a tithe that you want to do, or you can deliver those in the mail or give online. But Lori Hammer, there's some special things going on. Tell us what's going on. Uh, hi, everybody. Happy non-sunny day once again. Uh, we have a lot of things going on at Skit, and I just wanted to, before I start my exciting things, thank you for coming. Any of you who came to see Hello, Dolly?, uh, we did get to do the second weekend. If you, We tried really hard to get tickets of that first weekend changed to the second weekend. If you didn't hear, 12 of our cast pimp members got COVID during that time, and we didn't want to inflict the audience with our wonderful bugs. So thank you guys for coming. It was a really, really fun experience. Uh, what's coming up next? See how I have a prop with me? Very nice. It's That's tiny, isn't it? Dramatic looking. <laughs> Mike Slokowski made this for us. We have Night Among the Stars coming up this, this Saturday. It's our one and only fundraiser that we do at Skit, and it raises money for all the scholarships we need for the teens to go to camp or theater classes or whatever they want. And so we have wonderful angels that come in our lives that make us beautiful fishing rod racks. I'm stunned. This is, like, amazing. So we are doing that this coming Saturday, and if you would like to attend or find out how you can donate anything to me, that would be wonderful. We would really, really appreciate your help. Um, I know this is my Canadian's going to come out right now, but what we need is bums in the seats. And I don't, I, I mean bums bottoms. in the seats. Yeah, okay. see, I know what that means, but I don't mean... Glutes. Yeah, I mean you need to come. I don't mean homeless people, or I don't mean what people... I didn't realize that was a bad thing to say when I moved here from Canada. So if you would like to attend, your bottom is most welcome, is what I need to say. Uh, or if you have an item you'd like to donate, I'm going to be sitting out after church um, being humiliated and would love to chat with you all. What we're trying to do is for the scholarships, but we are doing Frozen next year here. I know, right? Super exciting. What I wanted, part of the money from the auction, we want to figure out how to turn this whole stage into like a frozen wilderness kind of thing. But that's a lot of flats turning around and people bringing frozen trees and stuff out. But I'm told there are these new projector screens that can just, at the touch of a button, have all of the side walls look like they have icicles hanging from them and things like that. So when I describe wonderful things like that, that usually involves money. So that's what part of the auction is going to. I I'm excited. That's yeah, all. and one <laughs> of the other ways they make money is through the, the plays, through the missions. But because they're in partnership with us, for the neighborhood, they were giving one of those plays away to the Lancaster Village, which was one of the weekends that got canceled. Correct. But Skit's going to do something still kind of creatively, innovatively. Can you share a little bit what you're going to be doing with sure. Lancaster Village? Well, we've been rehearsing at the auction. We do a live auction, silent auction. There's a dinner here. This whole room transforms, and it's wonderful. But uh, so we, we do some performances with the teenagers. We do three pieces, and we've been rehearsing them for the last couple of weeks. And so we're going to go on Saturday. We're coming here for a rehearsal at, at 1. And then we're all going to get in our cars, and we're going to go over to the village, and we're going to perform for the seniors, and then we're going to run back here. Wow. We're I'm, not going to run while we're singing. Yeah, but Yeah, because Lancaster Village is our neighbors, and we want to be for yeah. the neighborhood, and Skit has joined us in that mission. 
and we're excited to be able to offer that to our neighbors who weren't able to come here, but now you get to go over there. Going and seeing is also all throughout the Bible, so that is probably even more biblical for you. It is. It would have been wonderful to have them come here and see the play, but this is probably easier for them not having to move all the people, so we're going to go to them and yeah. see how that goes. Well, we're going to move move back into worship, and I'm going to pray over Skit and their Night Among the Stars and that to go well. Um, but would you stand with me as we get ready to sing and hear from the Lord today about uh, the tree that sometimes we don't want to talk about or the tree that's kind of really hard to talk about. There's some things in our lives that aren't always easy to talk about because, uh, you know, we don't know how everybody feels about it or we're kind of maybe feeling a little guilty about it or it's just hard to discuss. And we're going to have that conversation today through sharing stories. But let me pray overnight among the stars. Lord, thank you for the the drama that we can share with people for uh, entertainment, but it's also more than that, that teens have a place to go and a people to belong to uh, like Skit, Lord. So we pray that this Night Among the Stars, this fundraiser would bring in all the money needed for the work you're calling them to do. Thank you for the the people that have volunteered and donated. God, we thank you that it's not a, a one-person show. It's a community. So God, we, we, we pray for those who are going to be the bums in the seat, that they would hear your, your call on Skit and how they're changing and transforming teens through theater for your glory, God. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in, in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still.
shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed. Jesus face Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing
can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. and just you can just stay where you are and you can sit down if you'd like or you can say Sandy but we need to to lift some people up in prayer and maybe there's some things in your life you'd like to be praying for and 
So I just want to pause for a few minutes. And I want to, we'll just all close our eyes and just want to give ourselves a little space to pray. And as the moment, and it seems really quiet, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some things that, that maybe you could be praying about specifically in our church family and our neighborhood. And So right now, I just want to pause and just, just open up, give God permission to, to, to speak to you, but also understand that God is also listening. So let's just take a few moments to understand that is true for us right now. Thank you for being a God who hears, but also a God who speaks. And Lord, we want to hear what you have to say. That's why a lot of us came today. But God, right now, we want to lift up the things that are heavy on our heart. And I'm right now, just people in our church family. So if there's folks in, your, in the church family that you know that are in need of prayer, I want us to just spend a few moments to pray and be thinking about them right now. Ruth and Terry Hegley. You know their situation, Terry being hospitalized and at home, and they're in need of unique care. Let's spend time to pray for our, our siblings, Ruth and Terry Hegley, in the faith. For those that may, might not be here today because they're ill or sick that you know of, let's spend time praying for them right now. God, hear our prayer for the, for the folks that we work or live next to. And we see maybe struggling with pain or hurt or decisions that are hard, God, we come to you right now. For anything else that might be on your mind or heart, I know there is so many things we can spend time praying over. What else might you want to say to God this morning? Lord, we acknowledge that you are the God who's with us. God, help us to see that. Help us to trust that. Help us to stand on that today. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, I am so glad you are here today because we get to kind of do an overview of the whole tree sermon series that uh, we've been going through for the past almost two months now. And this isn't a great Caleb idea. This was just something that I, folks that I meet with regularly, um, one of the pastors did a tree sermon series as well. And they covered some of the, we did some of the same ones they did. And I got to use some of the, the material they use. Matt Holland at St. Thomas Covenant Church, downtown Salem. Um, great pastor, great guy. And I really appreciate him helping, you know, share some of his things so that we could benefit from the trees in the Bible and how they teach us about God, but also about ourselves. And so we're going to go through those trees and we're going to end with a tree, um, you know, uh, wrap it up with one last tree through a testimony today. So the first one, uh, just so you guys to go through, let's see if this, we talked about trees in the Bible. The first one is this one. This is the tree that tells us that God knows you. Jesus met Nathaniel, who is under the tree, and he said something so personal to him that, that was like revelation, revolutionary. It changed him. It's like, oh, you must know me. You are the God that we have been looking for. Like, he made this revelation. God knows you. This is a tree of Nathaniel. Then you, if you see this, this, this picture, you probably know what this is about. Anybody know this Bible story? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was 
Okay, some Sunday school advocates in here. Uh, God desires you. This tree shows us that God desires you. He walks up, he sees someone in the tree named Zacchaeus, and he says, I want to go to your house. I'm going to have lunch, dinner, you know, snacks at your place. God desires you. Then we talked about this one, where you need a bucket for fruit, an axe at the root, and a bucket for manure, an axe for grafting. That's a lot. That was a, that was a long, a lot of trees in this one. There's four different trees. God told the Israelites, don't cut down the fruit trees because I want them to be there to sustain you. So you need a bucket to reach those. Um, he says, if you're a hypocrite, I've got an axe ready at the root. That's Jesus in the New Testament. And then we have another bucket where there's a parable where, where there's this man who says, don't get rid of this tree. Give me one more year to fertilize this tree. God is a God of second chances. And so fertilizing manure around the tree. And then the last one, acts for grafting. If you're not part of this faith family, God wants you part of this faith family. He says, you know, there is room. I will graft you into my story. I will graft you into my people. We continued, and we talked about the mustard seed and how Jesus was teaching, you know, start small. This tree that was, you know, started from a seed that was the smallest of all the garden that grew to be the biggest and the one that drew the, 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 the birds of the air to bring deaths. Then we talked about the tree that, that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of, and it was a warning that, hey, pride, be aware, kill or be killed. And thankfully, King Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament learned this lesson. However, his son or grandson didn't, and he had the consequences of pride, taking, I, I use the word plagiarism, taking credit for when credit wasn't due, you know, saying, I'm, I'm the one that did all this, not God, and it was pride, and that ended up killing King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And then we talked about Abraham. We actually, um, you know, the story where we remember that Abraham, he planted a tree that reminded him of God who provided this well in a foreign land, and he said, I'm going to plant this tree. It'll be a memorial to that promise, and we did that type of planting outside, right outside, we see a little, uh, what is it, golden evergreen, where it's got golden tips, evergreen tree, um, and we memorialize the people in our life that God has given us, that have passed away now. Uh, Everybody got to put in a little cup of dirt, so that was fun. Um, And then last week, we talked about how God keeps the stumps. We're out of this stump that resembled a lot of the people of Israel's disobedience, God brought new life. God brought, he didn't like start over with a whole new tree. He used the roots of those decisions and the stories that kind of proved the Israelites were, you know, unsuccessful. They were disobedient. They weren't perfect. And yet God used that and brought up a new shoot, new life. And today we're going to talk about this. What kind of feelings come to mind when you see that? This is a tree in the Bible. Now, not a literal tree, metaphorically, because this tree to me, when I, when I was thinking about our, our, our topic today, and this has been something I've been thinking about for a long time, like this kind of tree is kind of, I don't want to get close to that. Anybody else feel the same way? Like it's kind of scary. It's kind of frightening. It's kind of hard. It would be hard for me to, to look at it, get close, because it looks almost haunted or cursed or or. or harmful or dangerous. And that's tree, those trees are in the Bible. And specifically, there's this one that we don't really talk much about as a church or maybe as a, as a Christian culture. And perhaps we've looked at this tree in a bad light. Let me tell you what I mean by this. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 through 5, it says, When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Now, Judas, if, if you're not too familiar, he's, he was a disciple, follower of Jesus that Jesus selected. Judas, who was a follower of Jesus, was there through all the healings and the curing of leprosy. He was there when Jesus fed the 4,000, fed the 5,000. Judas was there, and he was sent. Jesus said, you need to go and share this message. This is the same Judas. And yet, we find Judas who made a decision to betray Jesus. And it says this, Judas said, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? The people that Judas conspired with. What does that say to us? See to it yourself. Deal with it yourself. 
Throwing down the pieces of silver, this is Judas, in the temple, Judas departed, and he went and he hanged himself. That's not always the easiest scripture to preach on, is it? This moment of perhaps Judas's like lowest moment in his life makes a decision to hang himself. Now, there's, some, there's different controversies out there on what actually happened, but, I mean, the text is pretty clear. He, he dies by suicide. And that's not an easy topic to talk about. And it's not an easy a tree to get close to and think through. But we need to understand, like, there are our world in our neighborhood, perhaps your family, have mental health challenges, have mental health illnesses that are real. We're just like maybe Judas being seeing suicide as the most logical choice. I'm not a practitioner. I'm not a counselor. I don't know everything about, you know, mental health and, and that, like, getting into that place of counseling. I can direct you to some good counselors. But we need to know where is God in those moments. We need to know, like, how does God be Emmanuel? Like, in, in those places, like, how can we get close to God? And that's why... This is such a hard story because it's so personal. And in just a few moments, I'm going to invite Tamla Unrein, who I met through a couple of events that we did with The Rock, Recovery Outreach Community Center. You got to hear from them last week, where I got to meet Tamla in her story and how suicide has played a role in her family. And it's going to be real personal. It's not easy to talk about those things. But as a church and as Christians who, who point to good news, we need to know and we need to see and we need to trust that God is with us. Because perhaps this is true for you. Perhaps you're struggling with mental health. Perhaps your neighbor is struggling with mental health where they might be thinking, and no one knows this but them, they might be thinking the only choice is suicide. And it might seem like the right choice to them in the moment. But we're, gonna, we're just going to have a conversation about it. And um, so as I'm going to invite Tamla Unrein. Tamla, come on up. Uh, can we appreciate Tamla? <laughs> yes, I'm so glad Tamla's here. I'm going to pray for you. Um, and I'm just so thankful you sharing your story because I know whenever we get up here and we share and we speak, it, it, we, no matter how many times I've done it, I always get nervous. And I never say everything that I want to say, and I say probably more than I should have said. Um, so that, that just happens. And so I'm going to pray, and then Tamla is going to share a little bit of her testimony and her story with you, um, because we want to be uh, people who, who have understanding and knowledge, but also be strengthened by one another's stories of God moving through them. So let me pray. God, thank you for your scripture and your word that it, it doesn't, it, there's just so much there that you allow us to see and read that we can still connect with today. And, and the things that we're going through in this world with mental health and suicide, like that was something that we see in the scriptures thousands of years ago. And today we, we get to hear just how that looks today and how that's been affected, um, you know, your, your people and where you are in that, God. And, and we thank you that Tamla's here and she's sharing her story. God, give her the strength to share what you've called her to share and, and show how good you are, God. So we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, first I'd like to say thank you to Pastor Caleb for inviting me to come out to talk today. And thank you all for having to sit there and listen to me. I got a good audience that you can't leave now. Yeah, listen. Uh, my name is Tamla. And yes, you heard that right. It's Tamla with the T. Um, oops, I had it upside down. And they did give me this awesome equipment to use. So um, my parents had a hard time deciding between Pamela and Tamara, so they mixed them up into Tamla. And um, it's and then with that last name like Unrine, it's a mouthful. So Needless to say, we gave our kids really easy names. Um, like Pastor Caleb, I am not a um, all-knowing on mental health. Um, 
what I, my story today is uh, what, it, how it affected my family and myself and then how we have moved on. Um, Matt, our, our oldest, died by suicide, and we didn't know Matt had any suicidal ideation. So just like with every, all of you, I'm still learning about um, what suicide means to me and how best to portray my message to you. I know um, from my little dabble and, um, well, my five-year little dabble, is that it's very important that we talk about suicide. Um, for Forever and ever, you know, it was just you didn't talk to your kids about it because if you did, that might give them the idea that, oh, hey, that sounds like something I want to do, which makes no sense at all. So I do know we need to um, be kinder to one another and we need to speak to our children. This should be a topic, in my opinion, that spoke to them over the dinner table. Um, it needs to be, I think every high school when you go, or middle school when you go and um, uh, register your child, I think every parent should be given a packet that has some resources in it. So if that topic comes up, or your child has a friend, or your young adult, or anyone of your friend, a parent has some resources. It's a scary thing. I never talk to about it with my children because it's scary. It's just, we'll, we'll shove it over there and not talk about it. Um, and studies have shown you, by speaking about it and bringing it to the forefront, um, you're not gonna give anybody that, that um, idea. If a person has some suicidal ideation, um, you aren't the first to tell them about it. But talking and, and, and resources and stuff, that's where we all come into play and to be kind to each other. So this is basically my story of how we, our family survived um, our family trauma. Um, that's our family. Our youngest uh, on the left is Mark, and then my husband's in the middle. My daughter, that's at her uh, graduation at Western Oregon. And then her husband, or boy, fiance at the time, he's now her husband, myself, and then our oldest son, Matt. Um, I've been married to my husband, Darren, for 33 years. We live in Mount Angel. And uh, Darren is the yin to my yang. And uh, to go and add a little bit about the tree, he is the um, trunk and the, the strong part of the tree. And I'm the leaves that just, bleh. You know, I'm, he is very stoic and very serious. I'm kind of more of the free spirit, adventurous type. Um, so, yeah, 33 mar years of marriage is... Um, I'm pretty proud of that, so. Um, I have three children. Matt's 32, Emily's 28, and uh, Mark's 26. So as a mother, having lost her oldest, um, Matt, would have, Matt was 27, sorry, when he passed. He uh, would have been now 32. I get this question a lot, how many kids you have? And depending on what my mood is, sometimes I always just say three or if I'm in a or the situation allows it, I will go into detail. But I have three children. I have three. No matter one takes away, two takes away, all of them are taken away, I have three children. Um, we attended church regularly. Uh, we were kind of your average family, I, I, I thought. I don't know what that really means, but in my mind, that's what I thought. Um, my husband and I coached them from T-ball. They uh, were... Um, we were very active in our church in Mount Angel. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's home of Oktoberfest, but you can't miss seeing the big Catholic church in the front. So we, uh, uh, I was Protestant growing up, and so this is, I'm rocking this church. This is awesome. These are my roots right here. And so when we moved to Mount Angel and I got married, we wanted to raise our children in one denomination, so I converted to being Catholic, but you guys are my people. Um, so we were really involved in church. Matt was altar server, kids, and all that good stuff. Um, the whole soccer mom term, you know, I ate it in their class and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so there's Matt. He uh, had a love of motorcycles, and that was his first Harley that he bought. And if I get opportunity, and I don't talk too long, I'll tell you about a little bit about our fundraiser that um, includes motorcycles and whatnot. So firstborn baby, I mean, you all know, you're just sitting there, and you've, you're, you've arrived as soon as you hold that baby in your arms for the first time. So he and I had a really, really special bond. Um, we actually worked together. We have a small family business in Brooks, and we build steel stairs, and um, Matt worked, so I worked with my brothers and my dad, and Matt worked with us. So I got to see him every day, and so 
boy, I thank the Lord for that every day that I, you know, every, well, every day I went to work, but um, I, Matt was there, and so we had a really, really neat special bond. Um, and then in 2017, uh, we got that horrific knock on the door that nobody parent, uh, no parent wants to, wants to have. I don't know if I have any middle schoolers or high schoolers in here, do I? A few, okay. Be nice to your parents. <laughs> you never want this to happen. This is every parent's worst, worst nightmare is right here. And uh, we got it at 2.30 in the morning. Um, and it, the knock was, obviously, I kind of already said this, but it was about our firstborn son who uh, died by suicide. Matt was super smart, really witty and funny and happy and genuine. He would help anyone. If you were down and out, he would give you your last dollar. He was super funny, uh, often at times inappropriate for a mom, but he was very well loved, so I guess it worked for him. Um, and Matt struggled with anxiety and depression, and I didn't know it. I'm his mom. This is my firstborn child. I should know everything about him, he, especially working with him every day. Um, we did not know he had any suicidal ideation. Right towards the very end, I mean, now looking back, you know, I'm like, oh, that's what he meant when he said that, um, that I would come into the parking lot uh, in my car, and I, you know how you can, like that, and he'd say, ugh, do me a favor, and I'm like, oh my gosh, don't say that, but, so he started, we, we, we now can kind of pick back that, gosh, that, I think that's, that was the depression and anxiety, and he was seeing a counselor at the time, new to that, and he would come home, come to work after, after seeing the counselor, oh, mom, she was great, you know, you'd really like her, and so happy for him, and he was unfortunately in a, um, in a toxic relationship, too, so they had a lot of um, things going on, anxiety, the depression, um, you know, not being in a, in a great relationship, and like most people with mental illness, he self-medicated with drugs and alcohol, and um, you know, being our firstborn, there's always that little dabble when kids become, you know, graduate high school and get into their 20s. And in my heart of hearts, I've mean, dabbled a little bit much, but in hindsight, he was self medicating. Um, some of the fallout of now only having two children is that my daughter is now, who our, was our middle child, is now the oldest. Uh, my youngest son doesn't have a brother. You know, my daughter has still have a brother, but my, my, my youngest doesn't. Uh, he's never going to be that funkel, you know. Um, he, he's never going to get to be an uncle to Matt's kids. I'm never going to get to hold Matt's grandbabies in my arms. Um, and then the whole question, you know, how many kids do you have? That still, when I get it, it still just kind of gets me to my core. But, you know, I have three. Um, all of our family pictures are c incomplete. I really struggle with this one. Uh, I have a brother that I work with and my nephews. And when they take, you know, I say on Facebook, all their family pictures and stuff, those are all complete. You know, their family's growing. I'll never have another, um, the picture of uh, Emily's graduation was our last family photo. So, yes, I've, I've obviously added a grand, or a son-in-law, and I've grand, now grand, I'm a grandma. Um, so our family's growing, but our family pictures are never complete. And that just hurts my heart. You know, it, it's, it will never be the same. And I struggle with that a little bit. But what does, su what does being a survivor feel like? Um, and not necessarily a suicidal, um, a survivor of suicide, but a survivor of a loss of um, a parent or a grandparent or any tragedy that we've had in our life. You know, if we're all sitting here, and I know um, our, all of our, most of our lives have probably been touched by some tragic event, but we're still sitting here, so we're all survivors. Um, being a survivor feels like guilt. Like, as a mom, I, mean, I think it touched on it. How in the heck did I not see this coming? I mean, we mothers put a lot of guilt on ourselves anyways. But uh, we're losing a child to suicide, that's a tough one. Um, laughing and enjoying life, you know, really at the beginning really felt inappropriate at times. You know, I remember uh, the first time I, I actually smiled or laughed after we, he passed and you kind of feel guilty. You're just like, oh, you know, should I? But life goes on, and um, life is to be enjoyed. And, and that's what Matt would have loved, and that's what any of our loved ones would have loved, is to take life by the reins and the gusto and really enjoy life. Uh, so while it may feel inappropriate, especially in the early stages of your, your grief, 
um, it's really important that we love and we laugh. Uh, being a survivor feels like shame. Gosh, you know, there's a lot. What did I do wrong as a parent? Um, th- just how, how did I not know this? Uh, we must be really, par- really be terrible parents. And, you know, that all those weird things come to you. Um, is society judging us? Uh, are, are peers judging us? I kind of thought so. I mean, I was in that. I used to judge people. If I heard somebody that, you know, you read on the news or something, I'm like, oh, man, their parents, they must have, you know, been brought up in a broken home or all these things. And, and I was kind of judgmental. Um, that's one of the good things that's happened since we lost Matt is I have taken off that judgment hat. So, um, but it, it, it's, it's kind of shameful. I think, I often think if Matt would have lo- um, been lost in a car wreck, w- the results are the same, but for me, sometimes it would have been easier because you don't have the answers. Your biggest one is why, and you're constantly trying to find the, the puzzle pieces to put things back together for this to make sense because I don't understand how you can choose death or suicide over living. I don't struggle with mental illness. So it's just, wow, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, being a survivor feels lonely. My arms will never, ever, ever get to hold him again. And I think that's, I'm sorry, I'm going to choke up a little bit. I think that's one of the really hard things as a mama is not being able to hold him anymore. The picture of uh, the graduation, I can still feel the, uh, the, Matt's hand on my back. He, he, he put his hand on my back when we took that last family picture. And I don't know why I can still feel that, but I do. So holding him is uh, lonely. I still have a son, but, you know, I don't have Matt. Um, It still feels like kind of we're on a vacation, and he's still going to be back, even though it's been five years. It's uh, it's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if that's a denial. It's five years, but I mean, I know he's in he's in heaven, Uh, and I I know, praise the Lord, I get to go see him one more time again for eternity. Uh, And holidays are kind of different, you know. Right after Matt, we were um, lucky enough uh, to remodel our house, and it helped rearranging the furniture. We took down a wall, so. I never really got to visualize where Matt sat at Christmas and, and all that stuff. So, but holidays are really lonely. It's because he brought such a vivacious energy uh, to our family. And he was so dang funny. And like I said, inappropriate time sometimes that you couldn't help but laugh. Because he was just, he loved life. So he thought enough to overcome. Uh, being a survivor feels angry. Uh, I'm really mad that Matt put our family through this. I mean, come on, didn't you know what you were going to do to us? I mean, how did you not know? But with their mental health, they're not thinking rationally. Um, So, yeah, a little angry at him about uh, putting our family through that. Um, I'm I'm angry that I'll never get to hold his babies. I mean, uh, being a grandparent, we have two, and, ugh, it's my best thing ever. So I'm kind of really irritated at him for that. And. I'm gonna, we're going to go to blows in heaven, I think, when I... He's got some splaining to do when I get there. Um, I'm angry that I have to see his dad fight back, back tears whenever Matt's m- name is mentioned. Uh, my husband and I grieve very differently. Uh, this, is, this, this is my helpfulness. He, my husband is not so much. Uh, so if we're like this, he, which is why he's not sitting in the front row, but he has a hard time... Um, still, and so we mentioned Matt's name, you know, he still cries, um, and so that makes me mad that Matt, you know, is making his dad go through that, um, and I'm angry that his brother and sister have to experience such a loss, you know, uh, I, at first, when, when Matt first passed away, it was all consuming, you know, it was all about how I felt, and then I took the minute to look around, and, and now I've I've got two other kids that I, I've got to be strong because i got two other kids that really rely on me um, and a husband. And then uh, my grandparents, my, my, my parents were really, really close with Matt because we worked in the family business. And so to watch my, my, my parents grieve uh, was really kind of pissed me off, sorry, but it made me mad. Uh, being a survivor feels broken. You know, my heart is broke in a million pieces, and there's a chunk that's missing. You know, you hear all those cliches, but they're really true. A part of my heart is is gone. It, it will never, it will never fully close until I get to heaven and see Matt again. 
um, your soul just feels kind of empty and and grief is tired tired being um, grieving is really exhausting it's just so if you know someone that is you know um, be be sympathetic to that sometimes I just really needed to just sit and and in a room and and uh, and do my own thing I noticed uh, the best place to cry was the shower uh, that was awesome, or in the car. And so, because I didn't really want to cry around the rest of my family because then they worry about me and then I worry about them worrying about me and, you know, it goes on. So, um, yeah. Obviously, being a survivor is emotional. Um, I really didn't think I could ever cry so much. And I'm a great public crier. Did you see how I handled that? I cried and I, you know, great public crier. Um, and I can't remember some of the simplest things. And we call this grief brain. I was so happy that that was a real thing because I struggled with that after Matt. It's like, gosh, I can't f- remember the simplest of things. And they call it grief brain. And I'm going to ride that as I age. I'm going to ride that grief train thing because it's really worked. Like, it's grief brain. Um, and you get really preoccupied, obviously. You'll be, you know, talking or somebody will be talking to you and you'll have a thought and very emotional. So how do we survive family trauma? These, now this is my formula, and everybody, so if you can take one or two things away from this, that would be awesome. If not, I totally understand. Uh, But this is what worked for us, faith. Um, This is a big one. What's the the, um, stigma of suicide? They don't go to heaven, right? So I was so worried about that. I had to run down to our our priest and say, "Ah, is this true? And absolutely, it's not true. God is a loving God, a forgiving God. He would never uh, keep someone with mental illness out of heaven. I mean, the thought that I even had that I was worried about that is just crazy because of course, of course he's in heaven. Um, and 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 having a strong faith, no matter what denomination, that was really helpful to me. I really uh, felt God walking beside me so, so many times. And um, I don't know how people um, survive grief or trauma without God by their side. I asked somebody that this weekend who became believers later in life and they had lost a grandparent. and, And they're like, well, we mourned and we thought we were sad and all that stuff. But now they grieve um, having the faith, and they says, oh my gosh, your grief, it's just so much easier having that faith. Um, oh, I think, I, oh, there's our church. I forgot to push the button. There's our faith. And that's kind of how I felt with all those clouds. I was walking by one day, and, and I saw that. I'm like, man, that's kind of my mood. It's kind of mad, Matt. So I snapped that picture right then. Family, um, wow. This is my side, my family, and then my husband's family. This is at our fundraiser. And, I mean, you know, your friends are your family too, but that is a, this is a big one. So a lot of support. Obviously, we had a lot of support in, in working uh, at the same place that Matt did. I got a lot of support from work. So that was a super safe place for me to be. And my friends, they're the best. So uh, I'll never forget they came the morning that Matt had passed, And they're like, what can we do? And, you know, everybody says, what can you do? And I had them cleaning windows and going grocery shopping. And I was worried about all the people were coming to my house and was my house clean. And it was just, they all, everybody wants to help. So give them something to do. They don't care what it is. They just want to be there and help you. So please lean on your friends whenever you, whenever you need, because they're a big, a big part of your life and your um, surviving the four T's, touch, tears, talk, and time. Um, this is a big one. And when I'm in my car, something I can't ever remember the fourth T. So uh, if this would be a really good time to either take a note or take a picture of this. We'll go through each one. But um, a pastor came to our house the morning of Matt, and he told me this. And it just stuck with me, and he's, he was right. So touch. Uh, that's my husband and my, my brother. Um, after our, uh, our ride, our fundraiser that we do for Matt. So touch, we all know human touch is just so healing. So reach out, hug, 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 hug. Tears, cry, 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 touched on my places, my best places that can strategically cry, shower in the car. Um, the shower's awesome because you're already wet and you can really sob and turn the TV up or something. So um, tear, you know, let those tears fall, don't keep them back. And talk. 
like to do a lot of. Um, but find that one or two or three people and, and you know, really find them and, and lean on them. And time, time really does help. That first year that um, we lost Matt was that first year of first, first Christmas. My daughter got married six months after. So um, once we completed that year, I was kind of, we could exhale, I'm like, oh, we did it. There's no more first, I mean, obviously there's more first, but the um, first, the, you know, holidays and all that. So give yourself that good year and, and you're going to be okay. So just keep on keeping on. But time has helped. It does soften the blow. We're five years out. And while I obviously miss him every day, um, it's easier to talk about. Make new traditions. Um, my mom and I, my mom started this. And we, she takes a Christmas tree out to Matt's grave every day, or not every day, sorry, at Christmas, and puts, a, puts in lights, and she like, really gets into it. This year, when she had it figured out, it was lit up, and we had to go out at night and take a picture of it, and she's very excited. So that's our new tradition. We, uh, we do that together. Uh, another new tradition as, is that um, we decide to go on a family trip every other year. My husband's kind of frugal, so this is a hard one for him to get over. So I'm like, no, it's okay. We'll just say we'll take the kids, you know. And and he reluct he reluctantly at first, and then of course it's his favorite thing. He talks. That's all he talks about. So we went on a family vacation uh, the Christmas after Matt um, passed uh, to Disney World, and we, this is in the um, Atlantic Ocean. So we had to go dabble our toes in that. Oh wait, I gotta go back one. My new daughter-in-law is gonna be on the right. She they get married next year, so we're pretty excited about that. So. And Disneyland, you know, new traditions. Um, goodness sakes. So I didn't know I put that many in there. Um, have a purpose. This was a big one for me. I really needed, my um, lifestyle is, or, or I, it's just go, 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 fix, 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 do, do, do. And so doing this is my purpose. And um, if you can find the smalls of purpose, and it could be something so small as planting a garden or as elaborate as, I don't know, but find a purpose. That really helped us. Um, so we, with my, um, with, with working with my family and stuff, we were all grieving. And so we made a nonprofit and, um, and we raised money for suicide prevention and education. So that's our purpose. And it's really helpful. It kind of keeps the, you know, what do they say? Idle hands is the devil's work. Is that right? Did I get that right? Probably not. But Keep your hands busy. Um, surviving trauma is a choice. I really firmly believe this. I feel like no matter what, you got to get up, swing those feet off the bed, and choose to get up and choose to make today the, the best day ever. Um, many a time you don't want to, and I certainly didn't, but um, having a purpose and having my friends and family around me kind of forced me to get up and go do that. So I, I really believe that that's, I think every day is a choice. If you want to be kind to people or not, I just think that's a, that's a choice. Um, take care of yourselves. Obviously, drink lots of water, eat. Exercise is a big one, and, and get your rest. So that's, that's for everybody for every day of life. Um, our new normal. Our new normal is Matt's not there, and so it's a horrible new normal. But you have to navigate that, and that's really um, um, a big deal in that first year. You had to navigate that new normal, find your purpose, find things. So my name is Tamla, and I'm a survivor. So that's all I have. That's our little, that's when they told us they were having a gra our grandson. So I had to put that in there. They, we have two. One's 21 months, Jude, and um, one is seven months in Cooper. And I never know if I should say God help her or God bless her because they're really close in age and they're a lot. But um, they live in town with us, so we get to see them almost every day. So, so yes, my name is Gims Tamla. And if you guys have any questions, um, I think Pastor Caleb. Can we may give have her a round of applause? <laughs> I'll give you that back before I push too many buttons. Well, before we dismiss and we're going to have a benediction, we'll invite our team back up to do our, our benediction of God is so good. I had a question because we're trying to be a faith family that, bring, that causes people to feel belonging. And one thing I've heard in your story was that you were leaning into your friends and family. And my faith. And your faith. Yeah. For, you know, tell us, because some people choose to just run or avoid, or ignore, or hide, you know, when they go through trauma. And right. I think that there's some normalcy and some, like, that's a normal feeling. Sure. And maybe you had some of those moments, like, but what caused you to 
to, you said lean into your friends and mm -hmm. your family, like instead of maybe the opposite. That's my personality is to uh, go, go, go and, and, and try to figure out a way to survive. Um, what was the question? So why do you, what why helped I, you? Oh, yeah, yeah what, what helped you to like lean into friends yeah, and family? Well, you're probably not gonna believe this, but when we were having, um, we had our two kids. We had Matt and we had Emily back in the day, and we were trying to decide whether we should have another one. I just thought, gosh, you know, I just really want that third one because our children are our are, are, are gift, and we're all, they're all, they're not ours; they're God's, and so He only lets us raise gives them to us to raise. And I thought, gosh, we better have that third baby because what happens if something happens to, you know, one of them. And here, even way back there, faith has been such a, a big thing with raising my kids. Um, I don't know. If you don't have faith and you don't have family and you don't have friends, what do you have in life? So I just kind of felt like those were so important to me that why wouldn't I? I've given to my faith and I've given to my family and I've given to my friends, so why wouldn't I seek them in my, my, my most time of need? So I just leaned into them because I knew that God would be there for me. And I just knew that he, only he would be able to get me through these dark days. Well, thanks again, Tamla. Yeah. I really appreciate yeah. you. Thank and, you guys for having um, me. If you want to know more about, she actually has a memorial foundation in the name. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to have you share about that because okay. I did ask I will you real to. real quick. I know I'm keeping you guys No, over. that's fine. Um, um, you can always talk more about with her after service, but she's going to share a little bit about the foundation she put in yeah. memory of Matt. So for a purpose, um, we created a nonprofit, and my, my siblings and myself, and we raise money, and we give it to suicide prevention and education. And um, it, because of Matt's love of motorcycles and whatnot, we do a memorial ride up around Silver Creek Falls. That was his most favorite thing to do. We then uh, ride through the cemetery and give him a little honk honk or a rev rev. And then we end up um, at uh, Vanderbeck Valley Farms, which is out in Mount Angel. And we have a fundraiser and we sell tickets and raffles and, um, and just, and we feed you and all that good stuff. And so we've, each year our was five in $5,000 increments and we've been able to raise it. And so we were able this year, we also give out two $2,500 scholarships to our senior um, at John F. Kennedy High School, which is in Mount Angel. Um, because that Matt, well, he wasn't the best student. He, you know, that's pretty important to us to give back. So we do the scholarship, and then we give we give money. This year, we were able to give seventeen thousand dollars, which I know doesn't sound like that much, but we were pretty excited about it. That's to fun. Northwest Battle Buddies, and they train service dogs for our vets. Um, and so, since they started this foundation ten years ago, they have not they've yet to lose a veteran to suicide. So, which was pretty powerful for us when we found that out. It's like, gosh, our money can actually go to save a life because that was tangible. You know, everything else, yes, we can get up here and talk and suggest and stuff. But to us, that really felt tangible. So, yeah, we do that once a year. It's coming up on July 23rd. And it's not, um, what I love most about it is, is you think, oh, you're going to a suicide event. Oh, this is going to be really, you know boring but no we have cocktails and we have music and we have it's very uh, uplifting and um and we make money in the process so it's a win-win for all of us so that's our foundation yeah well let's give tamla one more appreciation thank you would our worship team come back up or those that are going to lead us in our benediction and you, everyone would you stand with me as get, we get ready to dismiss and in the lobby or up front, you can, you can talk with Tamla if you'd like, or if you want to know more about uh, the, the fundraiser Night Among the Stars, Lori Hammer will be outside in the lobby. Um, but thank you for being here this morning. I know not always, um, you, don't, you don't always know what's going on, you know, when you come and kind of what kind of, what things God's going to be speaking to you about. And I pray and I hope that there might have been something that uh, really resonated with you. Um, and I hope for us as a faith family, that if you're struggling or feeling like there's hard times coming, like you wouldn't run away. You would lean in. This is the type of place we want to belong to and create that belonging. So if that's you today, like I want you to know, like there are people here that would love to be with you, love to pray with you, love to show up and clean your windows. However you need God to be with you. We would love to do that. And that is here for you today, just to make sure you hear it from me, um, that you're not alone. So I'm going to give it over to Allie, and you guys, 
we're getting pretty good at this. At one point, I'm going to ask everyone to sing this in Swahili. So just be aware, this benediction is something that we all want to embrace as a church family, but I'll let Allie and Marceline lead us out. We'll see you guys next week. God bless.